Okay, so just a little bit of background before I go onto this incredibly ugly drawing. Um, <clears throat> the quantum mechanics really started with um, Pauli, okay, and with uh, Planck. So Planck came up with Planck's law in about 1900. Einstein made some theories. You had the structure of the atom determined in about 1910, 1911. And then there was a guy named Bohr. And in 1916, he came up with his um, Bohr theory of hydrogen. The Bohr theory of hydrogen, in a sense, led to the quantum mechanics because the Bohr theory said hydrogen atom has these electrons. They're orbiting, and he used actual... Um, circular or elliptical orbits that were defined by Newton's laws of motion. They were orbiting at a certain distance, and if you change the energy, they would orbit at a different distance, right? So there was a correspondence between the energy and the location in space. And he parameterized it up to hell to make it work, but it turns out as soon as they tried to do it with other atoms, three electrons, things like that, there were all sorts of problems. So in the 1920s, that's when the quantum mechanics was developed. It was essentially trying to fix the problems with the Bohr theory. They felt that the kernel, the basic concept of it, was correct, but that the specifics were wrong. So the functions weren't right. He used um, elliptical orbital functions, essentially analogous to what we use for planets around the sun. Not the right functions. How to use functions that described waves and so forth. Okay, so those calculations, those functions are incredibly ugly. And you have to understand that this was all done in the 1920s. In the 1920s, there were no computers. There were no calculators. All of the calculations had to be done with slide rule. You had to do everything on paper. Um, man, it was painful. Okay, and so it took them years just to be able to get an exact calculation for the H2 hydrogen atom. And they did that and it worked out great. Okay. The problem became when they tried to do more complex molecules. Molecules like CH4, which doesn't look a whole lot more complex, but you know, it's got five atoms instead of two. The atoms are connected in a very special way. There's a particular exact geometry you need, etc., etc., etc. So what this picture is trying to represent, and I know that it will be hard for you to see, and um, I, I wish that I had my models I could show you better, but if we look at a carbon atom, and a carbon atom wanted to make a bond with four hydrogens, the carbon atom would have four valence atomic orbitals available to it. It would have a 2s, which is here in the center of the sphere. It would have a 2px, which would be along this axis. It would have a 2py, which I put on that axis, which, oh well. And then it would have a 2pz, which would come behind and forward. And now, since they're all on top of each other, it's a really ugly picture, okay? What we would have to do then is to make one of the carbon-hydrogen bonds, we would pick an orbital. Like, for example, here's the 2px. We would overlap that orbital with a hydrogen 1s. See, that overlap would make one bond. We would then take the 2PY, and we would overlap that with the second hydrogen, and that would make that bond. We would take the 2PZ, the third hydrogen, and then we would have to squeeze this other hydrogen in some, somewhere, somehow, to make our fourth bond with the 2S. Right? You take the atomic orbitals, you overlap them together, that creates your bonds. Okay? All right. So, what's the result? Well, if we look at this picture, which is admittedly an ugly picture, what we get is the, um, two, I'm sorry, the um, 2px and 2py bonds are only 90 degrees apart. And the 2py and the 2pz and the 2px are also 90 degrees apart. Then, we would have to kind of try to fit this bond in here. 
it would be shorter because p orbitals are longer than s orbitals so we'd have to bring this thing in much closer so we would end up with a picture for ch4 that would say this three 90 degree degree bonds a third bond on the opposite side of some indeterminate angle and the three 90 degree bonds are longer than the fourth bond so the bonds are not equivalent okay the problem with this is that we already know this is wrong they already have experiments that show that first of all ch4 is tetrahedral so the bond angles need to be 109.5 degrees not 90. second we know that there isn't long and short bonds all the bonds are the same length so this is just wrong and you know if they had just stopped there uh we wouldn't have a theory okay we wouldn't be able to calculate bonding what happened was there was a man a professor from california actually his name was linus pauling we're going to talk about linus pauling several times in the upcoming chapters he was a really interesting man incredibly brilliant super into his chemistry i guess um, he was from caltech and what he did was he um, did what's called a sabbatical where you sort of get time off but you don't just get time off to play you get time off to go study something so he took a sabbatical to germany where all of the quantum mechanics was being developed and he spent time at the universities with those professors and he learned the quantum mechanics and he started looking at these problems and he said huh the problem here is that we're using the wrong atomic orbitals right if the if the atomic orbitals don't match our bond angles then clearly we can't get the correct bond angles what we have to do is change our atomic orbitals well how are we going to do this well what we're going to do is we're going to use math so we already saw that we could take one function we could add it to another function right so we start with two functions we add them together we get a completely new function the new function has a different shape it has a different energy so what Linus Pauling said was why don't we take our atomic orbital functions and combine them together on the same atom so this is different from the molecular orbital where we took a function from one atom and combine it with a function from a different atom let's just take two functions from the same atom and add them subtract them combine them together mathematically and create a new um, psi function those two psi those new psi functions would define new atomic orbitals and we call them hybrid orbitals because they're mixtures of the original atomic orbitals and the process of forming those new hybrid orbitals was called hybridization that process actually just involved mathematical calculations in theory they believed that the electron clouds were actually reshaping themselves taking on different energies and having different shapes so they believed that they physically were actually changing their shapes and energies but fundamentally it comes from mathematics now ironically enough this turns out to be not really correct but it becomes a useful model it gives us correct answers in a huge number of situations and so we can use it to visualize how the electron clouds are moving how the bonds are being formed and that's going to help us understand how molecules do chemical reactions now um, this theory then was named the valence bond theory All right, so let's first to talk about the math of forming hybrid orbitals. So what we're going to do is we are going to do math with the orbital functions. But the orbital functions are going to actually start with the same nucleus. So here I've drawn two orbital functions. It appears like the nucleus is separate, but really the nucleus is supposed to be the same so they should be right on top of each other like this so we're going to start with a 2s 
and we're going to start with 2p x-axis, this being the x-axis right here. Now, what we're going to do then is draw these right on top of each other like this. See how they share the same nucleus? Because they are um, orbitals for the same atom. Then what we're going to do is we're just going to imagine we add up the numbers, right? So we get, we plug in, we get a value here for the 2s, we plug in, we get a value here for the 2p, we add those numbers together. Okay, now we've already seen what happens when you add numbers. When you add numbers in a region where the orbitals are overlapped and they're both positive, we get constructive reinforcement. So the numbers get bigger, the cloud gets more dense. In contrast, when we add numbers where the numbers have opposite mathematical signs, like here, remember, one side of the p orbital gives positive numbers, the other side gives negative numbers. So if we put them on top of each other, the s always gives positive numbers, but this part of the p orbital is giving negative numbers. When we add those together, the numbers get smaller or even go to zero. So that's destructive. So that cloud is going to get less dense it's going to get smaller. And so the result would look something like this. We would have on the positive side, corresponding to the positive side of the p orbital, we would have a much bigger orbital lobe. And on the negative side, it would go to zero. There'd be a node. And then we would have a little tail. And most of the time, we ignore the tail. So we get sort of this teardrop-shaped cloud of electrons that we can then use to make a bond. Now, the problem with this again is that if I take these two orbitals and I only make one hybrid, I went from being able to hold two electrons here, two electrons there, one hybrid, only two electrons total. So four electrons being held here, but only space for two here. Where do the other two electrons go? What we have to do is we have to create a second hybrid, and we're going to do that by subtracting. When we subtract, all that happens is the positive here becomes negative, the negative here becomes positive, we get an orbital that looks exactly the same, just 180 degrees opposite direction. Now, these orbitals actually are defined by psi functions. We can calculate, but then we have to name them. Just like we said, this was psi, we called it 2s. This was psi, we called it 2p. So this is the 2s orbital, the 2p orbital. So in this psi function, what we did was we combined the s orbital, this is the 2s, with one of the 2p orbitals. So they named this sp. This is an sp hybrid orbital. Now, the other thing to notice is that we only used the 2px for this. The 2py and the 2pz are still there, but they are unhybridized. They are just basic 2px's and uh, 2PYs and 2PZs. Okay. Alrighty, now, the other thing to notice, and I, I didn't draw it here, but uh, you'll see it down below for the other ones, is that, see that black dot? That's the nucleus. It's the same nucleus. So these two orbitals are stacked up on top of each other, on top of the same atom. So what we get is, a positive large cloud going one way, and then another positive large cloud from this orbital going the other way at the same time. Now, it's really interesting. These tails, then, are stuck right in the middle of the other positive cloud. But those electrons don't kill, collide. That's because they have a property, pro, uh, a property um, called orthogonality. We say those those electrons are orthogonal, or the orbitals are orthogonal. It means they're perpendicular. And when they're perpendicular, they don't interact. The key thing about this is that this arrangement of electron clouds corresponds to one of our desired geometries. Notice, our clouds are 180 degrees apart. So we could use this to make a linear-shaped atom, right? 180 degrees apart bonds. So then Linus Pauling did the math for the other possible combinations, which just basically means take the s orbital, combine it with two of the p orbitals. 
take the s orbital, combine it with all three of the p orbitals mathematically. Now, the math for this is a little bit more complicated. There are, for example, little coefficients and crud like that. You don't have to do that. You just have to understand the concept. Now, one way to express this diagrammatically so that you can kind of see it is what we're doing is we're starting with a total of four atomic orbitals, an s, a p, a p, and a p. We're taking three of them, the s and two of the p's. So I box them up. We're combining them together. So we have three orbitals in this box. We're going to put three new hybrid orbitals. We're going to call these sp2. So this is sort of, again, abbreviating. We could call them SPP, but P and P together in an algebraic sense, we would say P squared. They're not really squared with each other, but in algebraic symbol symbology, it looks like they're squared. So they said SP2 or SP squared. SP2, SP2, SP2. We started with three orbitals. We get three out. We call them SP2 hybrids. We get a leftover P orbital because we have a total of four, we have to end with a total of four. So we have three sp2 hybrids plus one unhybridized p. Now, when these hybrids were plotted, we got a shape like this. The sp2 hybrids were arranged 120 degrees apart in a plane. Again, now this is a picture showing all three of the hybrid orbitals attached to the same nucleus at the same time. Again, we normally ignore these little tails. So this is an electron cloud, 120 degrees apart, electron cloud, 120 degrees apart, electron cloud. This is looking down from the top. This is the plane. We could also do a side view. So we could turn that plane 90 degrees. If we look from the side, what we would see is the sp2 orbitals would be arranged in a plane. This one, for example, would be in the plane of the paper. This would be poking out at us at some angle. This one would be behind the plane of the paper. And then perpendicular to that plane, there would be a p orbital. It would be the last remaining p orbital right here. It would still be on the atom. And it would be perpendicular because these two p orbitals were, for example, in the x and the y plane. So this p orbital is in the p. So when we use these two orbitals, they're going to create electron clouds only in the x and y plane. So this p orbital is going to be in the third perpendicular plane, perpendicular axis. Okay, so this is overall what the new atomic orbitals look like around that carbon. Now, the interesting thing about this is that 120 degrees apart corresponds perfectly with trigonal planar geometry, which is the second geometry that we need. Finally, then, we can do a similar thing with um, all four orbitals, taking the s and all four of the p's. And basically what happens here is if you imagine this, this orbital also hybridizes. It sort of goes to one side. It's a cloud of electrons. It pushes these others away from it. We get this. It turns out when we plot them, they form a perfect tetrahedron. They have a 109.5 degree angle. It's exactly what we need. Now, when we look at our thing, we took the S and all three of the P's. So we make an SP3 orbital. And since we started with four orbitals, we made four orbitals, and we've used up all the orbitals. There's no unhybridized orbitals.